So we're going to start, as we often do when I remember, with a moment of silence together. So let's just drop down into the silence. Peace, peace. Before I introduce BJ and we start, um, I thought I'd read um, a line from the Sufi Book of Life by Neil Douglas Klotz, 99 Pathways of the Heart for the Modern Observer. And um, BJ, do you know that book or do you know his work? I don't. It's really lovely work. Uh, he's in the Sufi tradition that our colleague Kira Epstein is in, and um, he's a remarkable man. And so this is um, the 91st pathway, and it's called Ad-Dar. When you are guided to this pathway, take the opportunity to reflect on the bigger picture of any pain, loss, or need you feel at the moment. And um, the comment is, the Sufi has been called the child of the moment. Uh, al Kashari, I'm not saying that right, relates this to a moment, to the way a moment of truth can return to us, to return us from delusion to self-honesty, sometimes with a harsh clarity. And here's the quote. This moment is like a sword, gentle to the touch but with a very sharp edge. Handle the moment gently and you go unharmed. Handle it clumsily and you feel its cutting edge. I'll read that again. And I'll read the quote at the start. When you are guided to this pathway, Aldar, take the opportunity to reflect on the bigger picture of any pain loss or need you feel at the moment. And the comment is, this moment is like a sword, gentle to the touch, but with a very sharp edge. Handle the moment gently and you go unharmed. Handle it clumsily and you feel its cutting edge. BJ Miller, welcome back to the new school and the learning community at Commonwealth. Thank you, Michael. It's good to be here with you, bud. How does this day find you? This day finds me well and safe as can be, really. I mean, that's, you know, it's a very loaded question these days. Um, but all things considered, I think I'm doing all right. I've been on the road and I'm happily back home in Mill Valley. Mm -hmm. So, doing okay. As most of the people on this call know, uh, you're a physician, author, and speaker, practicing palliative care at UCSF. Um, you were the former executive director of San Francisco Zen Hospice. Um, you're the subject of a film called Endgame. Uh, you've worked in all settings, hospital, clinical, residential, and home and your career has been dedicated to moving healthcare toward a human-centered approach. And um, you've been a friend and colleague for a long time. Um, I think many people know that uh, you lost uh, both legs and part of one arm when you were in college in, a, in an accident. By the way, we did a spiritual biography with you, which people could refer to, which mm -hmm. tells the whole story. And from that experience, I think it's fair to say a good deal of your life has been guided. Um, and um, 
we've been talking together about life and death for a long time, but this is the first time we've talked about it in a pandemic year. So I think my first question to you is, has anything changed for you in what you're seeing about how people around you and the media you see are holding life and death in a pandemic year specifically? Um, I mean, life and death have been with us forever, but there are these moments when death is closer for all of us. And we're in one of those moments. Um, and uh, so uh, it actually is, is very present for me at age 76 um, and, um, and present for many of us. So do you notice any change? Well, I think you put your finger on it that it is closer relatively. So it's, relatively speaking, it's, it's more intense. It's less abstract, I think is the way to put it. I mean, I think most of us move from you know, death. Is, we know death exists. We know it's out, you know. But over much of our life, that's just this abstract thing that sort of sits out there. And over time, whether through illness or just age or experience, we come closer to that. That, that becomes more real. I mean, you feel it in your bones. And so I think we've all just moved a little closer to it, and some of us a lot closer to it. So in some ways, it feels different, but in other ways, it's variations on old themes. Mm -hmm. so in some ways, it's different. some ways, it's much the same. How has it affected you at all, personally? <clears throat> yes, um, in a couple ways. One is I just got back from St. Louis visiting my parents. And another way of looking at this is like, this is an existential crisis. I mean, that starts sounding a little intellectual, but it, it is. And, intellect, and, and existential crises do odd things to us. Good things to us too, they challenge us. But this one's happening en masse. And we can circle back to that point because I think it's an important one. But I just saw my parents and my mother, you know, my mom, she had polio as a, when she was a year and a half old. She's, she's had all sorts of physical challenges throughout her life. But uh, she took on disability at, in a certain way that was common back then, which was just sort of you put your head down and just keep moving. And you, and you let and you deflect a lot of bigger fears. You just keep moving. And all that momentum has carried her through her 77 years in a certain way. But right now, the mix of her body getting frailer uh, and this backdrop of death in a new way for her is really throwing her for a loop. So when you ask me if it's affected me directly, my first thought is yes, via my mother's experience. I'm seeing thoughts come from out of her that I've never seen before. It's unprocessed heaps of fears and anxieties around life coming to a close that she's just never cared to look at. You know, it's not like many of us. And now she is, but it's sort of like the spigots turned on too much. And she, it's shutting her down. And it saddened me deeply to see, because there was a fatalism in her that I haven't seen in a while. I do think she's actually depressed too. But I guess my point here is that reality and that, that ungilded, it's no longer this abs gilded abstraction. That hurt, I, mean, I, I was pondering my own mother's death in ways I hadn't, because she was. And so that, that certainly really did, and it has been doing a number on me. Mm -hmm. um, and otherwise, I think the effects on me are, um, in some ways, like, it's odd. You know, I, I've always been wondering why the world doesn't pay attention to the, the acute possibility of death. And here we are doing that. And so on some level, I'm like, oh, you know, it's, it's ha something's happening that I've, in some weird way, I don't, I gotta be careful of my words, that I've wanted to see it, insofar as that we're all paying attention to a bigger reality. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm also noticing that um, I'm being called to have answers to questions I don't have. Um, I'm very moody. 
I'm checking where I can, where my proportionality, like what is my relationship to this subject and to everyone around me and to myself with it. I, I'm just sort of out of whack, mm -hmm. broadly speaking. But anyway, there's a, there's a range of impacts that I'm feeling personally. What about your father? How is he dealing with it? You know, he, he's doing all right. Mm -hmm. um, he, it's a, an interesting dynamic with my parents. My mother, uh, with polio and post-polio syndrome, she's got a body that just is ruthless to her in so many ways. Whereas my dad, my dad has his unnatural health. Like he, he's in better shape than he deserves to be the way he eats and et cetera. So he's, there, there's a real contrast between them right now. And in some ways that helps my dad hold the shoreline for her. And in some ways that makes them both feel lonely from one another because they're in such different camps right now. But in general, he's doing well. And one thing that my family has, we almost, oddly, we're almost more comfortable in a crisis. Uh, my dad knows what to do in a crisis. He doesn't know what to do when things are just fine. So in some ways, my dad's really um, mobilized right now and doing all right. But he's also falling back on, uh, I'm watching him. Ooh, excuse me. Maisie. Sorry. Sorry, guys. We may get to meet Maisie. We, uh, <laughs> you might get. You have a cat that may show up called got, Muffin Man. Muffin yep. Man. Muffin Man. Muffin yep. Man. So. <laughs> you guys might see Darkness is my other cat. Oh. Muffin Man is the one cat, and you might see Maisie, too. You know, I told you this before we came on, but I was doing a webinar with Rachel Remen, mm -hmm. and her cat appeared in the background, and somebody in the chat function said, it's not a webinar until the cat shows up. So, <laughs> <laughs> so we got yeah. Maisie, Muffin Man, and what's the other one? Darkness. Darkness, all right. <laughs> um, sorry for the interruption. Um, but where were we there, talking about dad? Um, well, oh, I just also say, I just his, he's also, we're all falling into our coping mechanisms. His yeah. mo coping mechanism is, is, is to worry about my mother, check, he's good, doing that. And then otherwise, he's kind of intellectualizing all this and sort of doing math about what his risk is and what his risk isn't and, and falls into political divides on it too. And so he's basically intellectualizing it mm -hmm. and, and busying himself. And you know, it's not just the COVID pandemic, as we know. First came, well, first of all came, how shall I say this, um, a period unlike any other in our political and cultural lives uh, that that's broadly descriptive without pointing in any particular directions then came covid mm -hmm. then came the financial and economic global crash then came the murder of george floyd and black lives matter going global mm -hmm. so we've had in a remarkably short period of time uh, faced the possible destruction of the American democratic system as we know it, yeah. faced a global pandemic, uh, faced a global recession depression where the number of people who were acutely hungry uh, will double to 265 million this year, mm -hmm. and then had this incredible experience of George Floyd and Black Lives Matter going global. Mm -hmm. And so it isn't one thing. And as you know, uh, BJ, we've been following this uh, through uh, the Resilience Project at Commonweal and <clears throat> looking at this not as a series of unrelated events, but rather as the result of a couple of dozen global stressors interacting unpredictably and causing the future shocks to come harder and faster. Mm -hmm. So it's a systems issue. It's a global systems issue. And, you know, biodiversity has entered a bottleneck, and this is very relevant to our conversation. Biodiversity has entered a bottleneck in which only a portion of life on earth will come through the bottleneck because of all these stressors. And we don't know whether humanity will be part of what comes through the bottleneck or what form humanity will take. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, while it is not at all unusual for any of us to 
catastrophize or blow out of longer term proportion uh, a set of uh, temporal events, this looks like the real show, you know, this looks like the real show. Yeah. And so we've suddenly, in the course of six months or so, uh, three months, depending on how you count, entered a whole new world. Mm -hmm. So life and death in the pandemic takes on a new meaning. Mm -hmm. So you said we'd come back to this as a mass phenomenon. Mm -hmm. So what are your reflections on the mass phenomenon? Well, <clears throat> just as you described, this is not, you know, these are not a series of individual crises. They are related. Um, and it's like the whole house of cards is, is coming down. And you could praise that moment as, as, as our, you know, poorly designed structures are coming down. Our illusions are coming down. We've all, we're always a hair breadth away from death, for example. You know, the idea that we have, could successfully buffer ourselves from it. That's, that, that's inaccurate, you know? So, but all these things, it's one thing to say those things, another to feel them um, and the world that you took for granted, even if you knew you were taking it for granted, as it sh shudders, that's still scary as hell. And I think um, this rattling of the cage in so many ways is, is past due. And you might, what does it all have in common? I suppose it has to do with um, sort of moral relativisms that we've been playing out, playing off each other, false divides playing out, structures that are inadequate to the reality that the populace is, is handling, is managing. Um, but a big, big picture, I suppose, the biggest picture to say is our relationship to nature, our relationship to the rest of nature. The fact that we've always contrasted human nature versus, you know, man versus nature, that's coming down. Um, so we could celebrate in a way that, that this is a, a massive spiritual awakening in the making, maybe. Um, I sure would like us to get there, um, but I also have to acknowledge in, we can't hop to those lessons too soon, especially while we're in the middle of it. We've got a lot of pain and suffering to wade through before we sort of, um, lessen it away, learn, like turn it into lessons, learn something and move on. We're nowhere near moving on. So uh, I want to jump to the, the magic that could be happening right now, but I'm afraid to do that too soon because we're going to leave ourselves too much of ourselves behind. We, we really need a grieving period. Um, well, we're, yeah, we need many things, but let me just say, um, back to this en masse question, when I worked with families or my own life, when I'm having an existential crisis, one of the hard things about an existential crisis is it feel, you feel very alone, um, you know, just dangling out in the universe. And that in some ways can be the hardest thing about an existential crisis. Um, but here we are doing it together en masse. So I'm a little, I do feel, along with this massive pain, there's also a massive empathy happening. And in some ways, though we're all separated mechanically, we're all maybe as primed or more so than ever before to feel each other's pain or to acknowledge each other's pain because it's the same pain we're all having, one version of it. So I get excited about this massive empathy moment, this massive togetherness moment. And we are maybe reacquainting ourselves with the things that we have in common especially as we examine the things that we don't share. I mean, it's, I think it's, we should mention, of course, it's Juneteenth. And this is a, a, a moment that I bet many of us on this call have never thought to celebrate or never thought to acknowledge in some way. I'll just speak for myself. But, you know, I've blown past this moment for years. And not, now I'm not. So there's something for there. For those who don't know about Juneteenth, say what it is. Well, it's a celebration of the Emancipation Proclamation, but the, the vagueness of the date has to do with slaves. I think it was specifically in Texas by the time the law was broken, but by the law came down that this, this slavery was abolished. It took a while for that to percolate out mm -hmm. to people who were now free. And so they were living as slaves beyond the moment where they were technically freed. There was this vague realization that slavery was over. 
And then I think this date also has some other significance of a massacre that happened in Tulsa, Oklahoma, earlier in the 20th century that many people don't know about. Um, but that's my understanding, and there may very well be much more to it. No, I agree with you. I think Juneteenth has, has come to visibility. I mean, you know, being 76, um, I was in college uh, uh, during Mississippi summer, uh, and um, when a whole bunch of people went down to Mississippi uh, to uh, break segregation. And so uh, having lived through um, that experience and lived through the 60s and 70s, which were, I mean, 1968, just to pick a year, um, was a revolutionary period of time. That, that whole late 60s, early 70s was a completely revolutionary period of time. Mm -hmm. And we haven't had anything like it since until now. Mm -hmm. But this feels potentially bigger than 1968, you know. Mm -hmm. And not only nationally, but globally bigger. Mm -hmm. And um, so I think you're right. There's this potential for transformative hope that we all hope for. But it's very easy to go there without recognizing all the suffering. Mm -hmm. And it's also true in periods of time like this that the transformation can go in dark ways as well as light ways. In other words, we have no guarantee that we're going to move toward the kind of transformation we want. You know, it reminds me a little bit of the 1930s in which there was the, you know, the struggle between the communists and social democrats on the left and the fascists and right wingers on the right. And so there was this equal polarization that mm -hmm. took place, you know, this very deep polarization. Mm -hmm. And while the movements toward progressive goals were deep and beautiful and in fact transformative in the long term, mm -hmm. uh, we went through a prolonged struggle with fascism uh, mm -hmm. that um, cost us decades and, I don't know, tens of millions of lives and just enormous suffering. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and the poll data shows in the United States, actually the poll data around the world shows that people everywhere are, uh, are far less hopeful than they have been in the past. Mm -hmm. And in the United States, what's really interesting is that the poll data shows that across the political spectrum, people are far less hopeful. So mm -hmm. what's interesting is that this moment on the one hand has the potential for transformation of the kind that we would like to see yeah. and on the other hand around the world people are uh, feeling very um, frightened despairing anxious and of course a lot of them are simply hungry or you know wondering where their job how many million jobs won't come back Right. because of technology and long-term effects on tourism and everything. Right. So we're in this situation where aside from a quarter of a billion people in acute hunger, there's just broad range of enormous suffering. Mm -hmm. yep. and, and so it seems to me the moment is all of those things. It is. Yeah. And and we're still, this is, you know, the, the, dis, the deconstruction is still happening. We're not, we haven't, I don't think we've natured. I don't think we've laid bare all the raw material and all the pieces, all the shards. We're still coming apart. And I think you're, I hear you, Michael, is saying a couple of things really important, which is one of these, we, we've got to help each other fall apart here still. Um, and there's a lot of room for compassion and let's just get through the day like acute kind of issues let's let's soften this blow where we can let's find relief where we can let's get a meal where we can for many people etc so in some ways it's not the time for imagining blue skying new structures etc but at the same time we we do need to do that because there's an op this, the, what we're also describing here is this oppor the opportunity when we've deconstructed everything to reconstruct and to build new structures. And there's going to be competition for what those structures are going to want to be. 
So yes, we have to stay in the moment with each other, deal with this suffering head on, which, you know, and, and we, we all in this, in this group probably know how to do that. This is, this is palliative care in some real ways, um, massively. And then, and we have to keep an eye on what, what we want to, what we want to build coming out of this and what we're prepared to do to fight for that. Cause it ain't, it's not going to be a, we can reflect on the 1930s in retrospect. Of course, it played out pretty nicely. We know who won that fascist versus the social Democrats on the left. But right now we don't know who's going to win this thing. In the meantime, winning, that makes us also, there's a tension there for me. When I want to mount up and start going to fight, fight wars around new structures, that's an us versus them. And that us versus them is not going to serve us right now when we're all massively suffering. We need to find our commonalities first, I think, and then we can build on the contrasts. Hmm. Natalie Portis wrote a great note. She said, say more of hope. I think T.S. Eliot's quote, wait without hope, because hope would be hope for the wrong thing. Mm-hmm. Wait without hope, because hope would be hope for the wrong thing. That's beautiful. I think what you just said is really important because it is a moment where at the same time, uh, the us versus them struggle of Black Lives Matter and the call for justice is an us versus them uh, moment. And not only can that not be denied, but it needs to be supported. And at the very same moment, we need to find, as you just said, what brings us together Mm -hmm. uh, across these enormous tragic divides. And it seems to me that you and I both know that what brings us together is healing. It's, uh, as you said, palliative care. You don't check somebody's political credentials when they come into your hospital. You're dealing with a human being in a lot of pain. So when you spoke of this as a moment for palliative care, I think that's actually quite precise. Mm-hmm. In other words, at this moment, uh, we seem to have a life-threatening collective condition. Mm-hmm. Um, if we understand palliative care well, it's not only for the dying, as we know, it can be in, invoked at any point in a critical journey to deal with uh, what we're going through as human beings. So that that palliative care, you know, analogy seems quite profound. Yeah, I, I agree. I just want to jump in too. I, I saw a comment from Steve, I think earlier about the, about palliative care and the opportunity for palliative care. I mean, I mean to, to comment narrowly for the discipline of palliative care, for the field of palliative care within the healthcare system. I do think that there's this palliative care is having a moment where it's proven to be essential, um, where it's not just a nicety on the side, where people get viscerally the power of, of actually bearing witness and not judging and tending to someone suffering because they're a fellow human being, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that, that is true in the narrow sense that I do believe its purchase within healthcare is rising. And that's nothing but wonderful is where I, from where, I mean, whatever gets us there. In, in, in palliative care, we're very used to this idea that tragedies and triumphs come together. You don't, you know, you don't have one world for the hard stuff and another world for the, they're all in this mix and you play them off each other, you work with them. And so that's very instructive for us within the healthcare setting, within the context of illness. But I think you're also pointed to something really key, which is palliative care is also, it's almost a philosophy, you know, it's almost, it's a, it's, 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 it's not just a healthcare discipline. It's an approach to life. And uh, that approach to life holds that suffering is is part of the deal, is not anomalous, and that compassion, that suffering is something that binds us, is something that we all have in common, and it's where it's where we can get to know each other. Um, so yes, on all fronts, I'm 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 almost excited for the field in this way, and it really needs to show up right now in a certain way, and I believe it is. So so that's really good. But I think also, um, I'm just going to circle back to this mac- the macro. I think another thing that palliative care does well is it holds a bigger idea of reality. And, you know, what I said earlier about we're, what's coming to terms, we're coming to terms with nature. Another way of saying that is we're, we're, 
we're being called to imagine a bigger reality than the narrow one we've been focusing on. And I'm very often reminded how myself and we human beings will narrow, will feel some conflict in life. And to manage that, we narrow our, our field of view to simplify things and make them more knowable and to make it easier to navigate. And that, that, that's, a bar, that's a convention and it's a borrowed, a borrowed time. You can't hold these narrow views of reality for very long and stay awake. And so what's happening right now is our ideas of reality are being shattered. And it turns out it's much larger. There are many more things going on, et cetera. So we're being asked to expand our capacity to deal with a reality that is much bigger, much more complicated, and has much less opportunity for control. Okay, we can't stop at that lesson because there still are things that we can control. We still do have some agency. And now more than ever, those once moments of agency are really, really critical. So this is two step of acknowledging all that we can't control and coming to terms with that while finding our where we can exercise ourselves towards a intended future. And we need more than ever to acknowledge what we can actually do. Not just it's not simply letting go. Letting go is half of it. Um, hanging on and some, is also very important in some real ways. So ooh, it's complicated, but there is a technology around that, a spiritual traditions for doing that, this medical tradition of palliative care for doing that. So we, this is just going to be tricky and it's going to really force us to, to, we can't fall down on pat responses. We can't sort of fashion a world that's, we don't look at the bad stuff and only hold to the good stuff. That's just not going to work right now, if it ever did. Hmm. Is this in any way informing what you see as your own path forward in your own work? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, oh, but can I say one more thing, Michael? I mentioned we, we, one of the audience members brought up hope in that beautiful quote. Yeah. I just want to circle back to that real quick. Yeah, yeah, please. Um, because it really is key. And one of the things we've learned from folks who are dealing with very hard moments uh, in their own lives in palliative care clinically, when things you see come up all the time is someone's hope being dashed, whether it's because they just learned that, that their cancer is metastasized or whatever it is, something in their, their reality has shifted that challenges hope. And the answer almost always, always is, in my experience, is always to contextualize that hope you know it's not it's not whether it's not hope is this s single monolith this immovable thing that you either have it or you don't hope is dynamic so it always matters what you're hoping for and so while it was you're quoting i mean hope may be decimated right now but that just means what we were hoping for has been decimated. So maybe now it's not like we should, we shouldn't lose hope. We should reframe it. Um, so I just want to make that point. We may feel hopeless, but I think that's because we're groping for what to hope for now. Um, well, I'd like to stay with that uh, for a little bit because um, I think about that a lot. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's very interesting. Um, you may or may not know I'm a student of a psychological system called Enneagram. Do you know anything about Enneagram? Yeah. A little bit through you, really. Yeah. That's a nine-pointed system of different personality types that mm -hmm. I've, I've done quite a lot of work on. And, uh, and three subtypes, so 27 different ways of looking at the world, and um, which goes very closely with the Diagnostic Psychiatric Manual and, and many other systems. But what I'm coming to here is how profoundly character structure and personal evolution affect one's experience of hope. Mm -hmm. So there are people who, when something bad happens to them or something bad happens in the world, feel their hope is dashed. But there are other people who, uh, when these things happen, uh, you were talking about your father who mo mobilizes in catastrophe. Mm -hmm. I'm like that. I mobilize uh, when things are hard. And so uh, for me, I have the strange experience, and I know I'm not alone in this, in having a quite dark view of what the situation looks like externally, but at the same time, living with a radical hope that is not at all disturbed, mm -hmm. honestly, by the circumstance. And so 
Um, and clinically, as you say, what I often see in the you know, 34 years we've done the cancer health program is that I always support people's hope, always. They may come in with an advanced metastatic cancer and say, you know, somehow I think I'm gonna beat this. Mm-hmm. And of course we have Diana Lindsay who's on the call, who's, you know, whatever, 14 year survival or metastatic lung cancer. And we've seen people beat these things. But more than that, even if the odds against them are enormous, I never ever try to diminish that hope. You know, yeah. I support it because what I know about hope is that it keeps readjusting or as you say, contextualizing as time goes on. So, you know, maybe I don't have a complete recovery, but maybe I get another good three years mm-hmm. or maybe I get another good year or maybe ultimately I die the way I would like to die or maybe I, and so hope to me uh, understood deeply uh, doesn't, the kind of hope I believe in doesn't get dashed very right. easily. You know, it doesn't get dashed very easily. Right. And, but it has everything to do with character structure, personality, and uh, whatever you want to call level of human experience and, and human evolution yeah. uh, as to how we understand. Because the deep connection between uh, hope and loss, uh, loss and um, awareness, mm-hmm. is just right in front of us, isn't it? Yes, it is. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. I mean, think, think, I think these distinctions or these this refinements, subtleties are so real, are so key. I'm glad we're talking about this. And I'm yeah. sorry I misquoted your, the person in the audience was Václav Havel, who is the quote, not T.S. Yeah, it's Václav Havel. Um, but it's so anyway, so, so right on. And I think what we're being so summoned here is an agility, an intrapersonal agility. And for me, hope is, is and so yes, it's, it's always a dynamic. I'm always trimming its sails based on the feedback I'm getting from the reality around me, et cetera. So this is the same game. It's just, it, the, maybe the free fall is more profound uh, or feeling the free, feeling of free fall is more disorienting. But these, these truisms don't change. I think we're, these, 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 this is one of those through lines. And for me, hope is simply some way I invest myself in the future. Um, Jeannie Brown from Kalanish, who runs this incredible cancer center that does the cancer health program in Vancouver, British Columbia, says, I think of it as hope is what the person says it is, not mm-hmm. what we think hope should be for a person. Mm-hmm. We redefine our hopes all the time. Uh, so, yeah, so this, this has a lot of resonance for people, this question yeah. of hope. I just did um, a... Uh, a beautiful conversation with a Canadian author named Thomas Homer Dixon uh, in our Omega Resilience Project series. He is the author of a book called The Upside of Down, and he's just written, uh, it, which is one of the best books on the global challenge or global problematique. He has a new book coming out called Command Hope, which he spent a decade on. And what he's really saying with the phrase command hope is he's saying it's like a healer uh, who, uh, who, who affirms healing, you know, it's like, so be it, right? Mm -hmm. It's like that capacity of some people to not only help you hope for healing, Mm -hmm. but to really say, so be it. So command hope is the sense that, you know what, in these circumstances, hope is by far the best way to live. Mm -hmm. So you not only hope for hope, but if you have it within you, you command hope, Mm -hmm. you know, you you assert hope in in a strong way. And I I think his new book is one of the deepest and most searching uh, perspectives on hope, because as he points out, if you go into cynicism and despair, it's because you believe there is no possibility for a good outcome. But suppose there's a 20% possibility. Mm-hmm. And suppose you can dedicate your life, you know, to the struggle for that. Mm-hmm. You know, it just gives it a whole different perspective. It sure does. And the creative, 
the, 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 the creative moment is where to apply that hope, where to channel it, how to push it, how to command it, in what direction, towards mm-hmm. what. And that requires sight, that you're really paying attention into your, so your hope is reasonable for the, for the moment. False hopes can certainly do damage too, or lazy hopes. Um, but yeah, so the, I think the creative moment here for us is to pick where we point our hope not whether or not we have hope. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So let me go back now to the question I asked you some time ago, and we certainly won't uh, end with this. We'll come back to the bigger pictures. But I'm curious in this moment, whether it's affecting what you want to dedicate your next films to. Yeah, it is. Yeah, thanks for bringing that back, Michael. Yes, it is. So I... um, it's made me get much more, I, I had been, I still do want to, the Center for Dying and Living, which, which is proudly part of Common We are, or proud for me. <laughs> We're very <laughs> proud of it. We're very proud of it. Thank you. I mean, I think that, that wants to be where I was heading was, was less direct work myself mm-hmm. and more towards education and mm-hmm. systems issues. Excuse me. But maybe. That's fine. Okay. Fine. Um, and and I still the Center for Dying Living still does want to be this big library, this catchment of resources, and this 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 filter through which we can see all sorts of interesting pre-existing knowledge around how humans deal with mortality, et cetera. And I, I I'm thrilled. I, that's going to be so fun to build that archive. But but uh, now I am reanimated uh, around direct service. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, my partner, Sonia Dolan and I, we, we pointed ourselves pretty quickly. Um, the library will still happen, but we now have uh, focused ourselves on, on creating this thing called metal, what we named metal health, M E T T L E metal health.com. It's just going live now, which is basically an online palliative care. It's essentially a hotline just to make it as easy as possible for people to reach this kind of, have conversations like ours, to reframe their health situation or whatever it is, to get support in real time. And we set it up is, uh, on the periphery of the healthcare system, outside the healthcare system really, so to minimize the, the middlemen, to get a, the, the gum up the actual transfer of care. So we just set up the, the, the most efficient way we can think of to actually directly work with each other, to work with people. And how are you doing that? How are you doing that? Well, we just set it up kind of ragtagged, you know, bootstrapped ourselves, borrowed money from parents and things like that to get through the legal fees. Um, We are raising a little money to do some branding work. Sonia built the website more or less herself. And we just kind of threw it up there. It's online now. We haven't. I love, I love projects like that. That's the way we do almost everything at Commonweal. Me too. Because we just start. Yeah. When I've learned that from you too, Michael, I've really, I've loved that. Just this, like the idea of like, I'm doing this. You guys can come along if you want. You can support it if you want, but I'm doing, it's happening, you know? And I love that spirit too. Yeah. And it certainly suits the moment. I mean, yeah. we don't need to polish it and get it just perfect. Let's just hang the shingle and start the already clunky work of talking hard shit out with yeah. each other. You know, so it's going to be clunky. It's, you know, so that's what we're doing. So it's happening as we speak. We're, we're, we're in soft launch mode. We'll probably start broadcasting it once we have worked the bugs out, maybe later this summer. But anyone's welcome to, to come visit us on, 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 the, on that. But, but just coming back to it for a moment, somebody calls. Who answers the phone? And- ah, so it's all online. So you just go online. You set up an hour appointment or a half hour appointment. There, you just fill a slot. And right now, will line you up with a counselor. You don't choose to talk to me or Lady Bird or somebody else. You just, you pick a time slot and we'll, we'll, we'll meet you either on the telephone or go to meeting is our version of Zoom that we've been using. And uh, is there a fee structure or how does that work? Yeah, so we're starting to, uh, to go, get around all the, the health industry structures. We are starting at fee for service. Mm-hmm. So it's, you know, 220 bucks for an hour talk. Mm-hmm. And we are aware there's tension in that. That is not an accessible number for a lot of people. But we're starting there so that we're not dependent on uh, mm-hmm. health yeah. industry. Yeah. But within a couple months, by the time we have the capacity, we'll have a sliding scale. 
and soon enough we will find our way to being included on uh, in health insurance uh, so for other ways of of payment but that's how we're starting to keep it simple so but it so it's gonna require all the logistics of um, you know like a telehealth appointment it has all the qualities of a telehealth appointment it does and on our list is at some point to build places we've always like you and i've talked about this some days we'd love to have in-person clinical spaces or not even clinical spaces to meet this is really a non-clinical endeavor we're not by the way i'm not i'm not going to be people's doctors we're staffed by chaplains social workers nurses and doctors all of whom are doing this, this same shared work. We've taken out the medical piece. I'm not prescribing medications. We're not taking on medical liability. So we're clinicians so that we can help our clients understand what it's like to navigate the health system. But this is not yet another clinical encounter with a medical record and all that. So, so it's metalhealth.com, M-E-T-T-L-E, health.com. Yeah. Well, I really look forward to following that with you. Thanks. Thank you. I'd like to go back to COVID itself. Um, and, you know, you and I have been following the, this closely uh, and it keeps unfolding in unanticipated ways. But what it looks like, just to paint a big picture, is there are some countries that will control it almost completely. You know, uh, some of the Asian countries, um, uh, they'll have outbreaks. China's a good example. They'll have outbreaks. They'll stamp them out. Uh, it helps to have a population uh, that follows directions easily. Mm -hmm. It helps to be uh, an authoritarian country. It helps to have an incredibly strong technology infrastructure. China is now sampling the DNA of every male Chinese person, mm -hmm. which combined with their facial recognition technology and their tracing apps, puts in place the most powerful uh, technological totalitarian system humanity's ever seen, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and we watch, while, while the Western versions of this are gentler, uh, we know that those uh, technologies for facial recognition, tracing, uh, DNA, and everything else are as present in the United States as anywhere else. In fact, American companies are helping the Chinese put this into place. So there's this huge technology piece. I mean, I think that when we look at this period of time in retrospect, it may well be that we don't remember COVID so much as the pandemic as we remember it as a turning point where the technologies of social control and of tracing went were amplified a hundredfold or yeah. some large number yeah. so there's that and then the countries that do control it will have to completely uh control human travel in and out of those countries with quarantines mm -hmm. and everything else so there'll be a massive decrease in that right mm -hmm. And then, then other countries like the United States or large parts of the rest of the world won't, for whatever reasons, be able to control it. Mm -hmm. So it looks like this is going to be with us for some extended period of time. Yep. So what is your reflection as we speak? I mean, where do you differ or what other emphasis would you put on what looks like the future of the pandemic itself? Mm -hmm. Well, from a sort of as a just a, from a human being point of view, there is this tension, right? I mean, we are freer to we're freer in this country to hurt ourselves. You know, we're freer. There, there is this real tension structurally in this uh, sort of a political approach of a, a more authoritarian, centralized, etc. It, it, you can make the case for right now that that's a safer way to be. It's a safer way to go. But of course, that much power concentrated is going to have all sorts of fallout. Mm -hmm. And here we are in the States having this very clunky, inconsistent approach, but it smells a little more free, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and I, it's hard for me to say what the right balance there is. Um, I wonder if you have thoughts on that, Michael. I bet you've thought very deeply about that, about what this the perhaps the better approach for the right approach um, from a systems or from a social point of view. Um, 
I mean, it's another reminder. Uh, technology is this funny thing. We keep seeding pieces of ourselves. Techno tech we keep outsourcing pieces of ourselves to technology. And somewhere along the way, the technology starts commanding us versus the other way around. And I don't know how to do that differently, but the idea that technology is here to serve us versus the other way around seems really, really key and something that easily gets lost. And for every convenience we open up with technology, we fill it often with just a bunch more junk. We make ourselves actually busier. Um, so there's maybe, maybe we've learned enough about the, how to handle technology and how to handle the power, such advanced power. I don't know. I don't look around and have a lot of faith in that, except for us, we as people seem to have our eyes a little bit open, more open, that we're not necessarily just giving ourselves away all the time. But anyway, I know I'll stop going on about that. Those are just reflections. I don't know what the right balance is here. Do, do you have a sense, Michael, how much should we be seeding ourselves to the collective? Well, that's a profound question. I, my, the, the answer I'm sure of is that we are involved in a global experiment as to what are the best ways to do this and what are the costs and, and benefits of all these different ways. What I will say is that in addition to the authoritarian Chinese structure, there are far less authoritarian structures. For example, Japan uh, uh, has a far less authoritarian structure, but they have, a, uh, they have two things. Uh, in many countries, I won't pick on Japan, uh, in many countries, there is a far higher level of social trust between authority and the population than we have here. There's been a dramatic uh, decline in social trust, particularly in the United States, but particularly among millennials and younger people. Mm -hmm. uh, in answer to the question, you know, do you think everybody's out for themselves? Younger people are much more likely to say that that's the case now than they were five or 10 or 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. So social trust is one of the many casualties of what's been going on in the United States. Now in places like Austria and Switzerland and Sweden, where social trust is high, it's really high, and you have populations that are inclined to follow the rules, mm -hmm. right? And so the combination of those uh, factors, high social trust and an inclination to follow the rules, uh, you get a lot better control. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I know something about both Austria and Switzerland and Sweden. Sweden mm -hmm. obviously took a course that others didn't agree with. They tried to keep their economy somewhat open and yeah. it was very controversial and remains so and they're still navigating it. But Austria and Switzerland just quietly have very democratic systems and yet quite good control. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't think there is one size fits all. Yeah, you know, I really, I, mm -hmm. I really don't uh, think that is the case. Yeah. But I, is there something else you wanted to say on that? No, you're just making me realize it's always when I find myself thinking it's one way or another is always the, the challenge is always to look for that third way. And whether, I don't think the question needs to be, do we need to become more authoritarian? No, maybe the answer to the question is we need to find a government, find a way to elect, uh, elect officials that we can trust and re-inject trust into our social contract. Another thing happening here is the social contract is, I don't know where that is anymore. That, that is ripe for revisiting. What do we owe each other? What can we expect from each other? What do we get to give each other and trust in each other? That's a big, big question. I'd rather that be our focus on or should we, versus should we become more or less authoritarian? Mm -hmm. So another question, BJ, that I've discussed with you and others um, is uh, started with a very personal thing that at 76, um, if I were to get COVID, I would not want to be taken to a hospital and intubated. Mm -hmm. And so I was relatively open in saying, uh, you know what, um, and this is partly characterological, I would want to be able to choose um, uh, how I ended my life, mm -hmm. basically, um, and whether I would not want to have to wait to be sure that the hospital or the hospice delivered the palliative care or end of life care, two different things, 
that I wanted so that I didn't suffer greatly. Mm -hmm. So now that it's clear that uh, COVID is going to be around for some time mm -hmm. and that um, and we are seeing advances. I mean, there's that new medicine that looks like it cuts by 50 percent the number of people who who die uh, uh, with acute COVID. Mm -hmm. So there are advances. And of course, we hope for a vaccine if and when that comes. Mm -hmm. But I remain concerned uh, about two things. One is our capacity to deliver to people the medicines they need so that they won't suffer needlessly. Yeah. And the second thing, which is a separate thing, but I'm going to put it in here, is that while the authorities tell us all about social hygiene and hand washing and all that good stuff, there's almost no mention of the health promoting things that you can do for yourself that make it less likely that you will get the disease or that you'll have a severe case. And to me, those two things mm -hmm. are inability to assure people that they will not suffer needlessly and our unwillingness to look at integrative or holistic medicine mm -hmm. as a way of promoting an inner shield mm -hmm. uh, seem to me critical ongoing questions. Yeah. Without a doubt. I mean, so, you know, we've always known, we've always known that the way we die in this country is problematic, especially within our health care institutions. We've long known that there's a lot, that there's a meaningful segment of the population who does really want to have that control over their self deliverance, to use your phrase, Michael. Um, We've always known that there's sort of inadequacies in how we think about these things. Um, and so basically what I'm saying here is the COVID has uh, just basically thrown, thrown, you know, thrown open the covers, thrown off the covers. We, a lot of us have seen these things for a while and now they're just laid bare even more so for the public. So no news in that. I suppose it's just ramped up the sense of consequence and the urgency to it. There again, like we start our conversation, this could be the this this is where COVID could be a catalyst. We do need to have a serious conversation. You know, the way we've treated the end of life options act basically, and set up this two week sort of structural way for you to prove that you really really want to die and qualify to have that power, and that I as a physician bless you to have that power. I mean, that, that is, um, it's a clunky structure and it's clearly a compromise uh, and it's built on things like the double effect and other things, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a threading of the needle. It's, it's allowed us to have something in place for, and for managing death in one's own life, but it's so clearly a compromise. There's so many flaws in that. And we, we've known that and now we really know that. So what are we gonna do about that? I mean, we, is, is, is society ready for a conversation about how someone who loves life can also choose to end their life? Are we ready to depathologize death? I hope so. Um, but I don't know how we're going to get to that conversation. I think you talking openly about it, Michael, for example, is a very helpful thing. And I also think it's also important that we remember that for, for the most part, it is also true that if you tend to each other's suffering, you know, the, the desire to hasten one's death often goes away. So as part of this idea of opening up structural ways for us to control our own deaths, I think we have to be very careful to make sure that we're not uh, blowing past ways we can make life much more livable for each other so that the idea of needing to hasten one's death doesn't even need to come up very often. Does that make sense? I mean, there's a, there's a, it's a bigger picture. I want to couch the idea of hastening one's death in a larger picture of how do we make life more livable for each other so, we, so to obviate the question of hastening death. No, I think that's absolutely right and profoundly important to do that. When I look at where the world is, not just with COVID, but with all of the sources of suffering, mm -hmm. um, 
And I look at this from a philosophical point of view. I, th I think the, the fundamental question goes back to John Stuart Mill uh, in, you know, the, in the 1800s in Britain and his principle that uh, we ought to have com complete control over what we do with our own bodies if it doesn't do harm to somebody else. Mm -hmm. That was a principle. And uh, that principle is constantly encroached upon by very well-meaning intentions mm -hmm. to be sure that we don't choose suicide or self-deliverance or whatever. And I don't think there is a, again, I don't think there's a single answer. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Of course, we want to make life better uh, in all ways so that people don't feel that need. But there's a philosopher, and I, I want to track this down, who, uh, but I, I read it because I began researching this, who said that he thought that the degree of freedom in a society could be measured by the degree to which uh, rational suicide or self-deliverance was available and legal. Mm -hmm. And so it's, to me, it's a very, leaving my personal issues completely aside, mm -hmm. uh, it's a fundamental question about human freedom and the limits of human freedom and the question of whether we take chances on the side of human freedom or on the side of uh, preventing mm -hmm. what we regard as harm to others. You know, James Hillman, the great archetypal psychologist, has a beautiful, extraordinary essay on suicide. And he says, all of our work on suicide is focused on preventing it. Mm -hmm. He said, but sometimes it may be what the soul needs. Yeah. You know? And so to me, I get criticized for this, and I'm happy to accept the criticism. Mm -hmm. But for me, it, because I don't really take a position on it, but I open the question, mm -hmm. which is, to what degree do our efforts to prevent harm uh, make it create more suffering for people mm -hmm. who for soul reasons or from their point of view, rational reasons, feel they've had enough. Mm -hmm. You know, the New England Journal of Medicine, I remember when I first wrote my first book, Choices in Healing, uh, it had an extraordinary editorial by a doctor who said that modern medicine has made it possible for people to live much longer. But in some cases, living much longer means that when the end comes, that they will suffer more because of, you know, all the things that were done to them. And he said he thought that modern medicine had a responsibility precisely because it had helped people to live longer, to help people with end of life so they didn't suffer needlessly. So I don't take a position, but I, <laughs> I don't take a position, but I, I do believe that it's important. Yeah. Sorry about that. No problem. Uh, this is a webinar. <laughs> this is this is real, right? Um, there's so much here. So much important stuff here. I mean, and I don't. And I think part of what what you're saying too is we have a lot of work to see that death is not our enemy, and so it's, uh, and that death is in somehow opposed to life. You know, they're not that there's so much structural work underneath what you're talking about to help us understand and help us um, metabolize this, understand the idea of wanting to die and how that's not a pathological, inherently pathological thought. You know, my, I lost my sister to suicide. Um, and even as I say that, I lost my sister to suicide. I mean, she chose, she chose, she was done. You know, there's a lot to say about her situation and there was a lot I think that could have been done to save her but of course when I realize when I think about that I'm I'm thinking about my own needs I, I'm, I miss her she was very clear what she wanted to do and she was very sober of mind when she did it and I think James Hillman is spot on there's there's a time where uh, that suicide is an essential maybe an essential thing for uh, a soul and who am I to judge 
And it's like somehow I walk some of these arguments is like we're offended that someone else would want to die. I don't know why that offends us. I suppose it loose the threat is it might loosen the social fabric that binds us, that keeps us on the planet. And if you start leaving the planet for someone else's planet, well, then I'm not going to stick around and all hell is going to break loose, I suppose, is what people think this sort of slippery slope. But to be clear, I don't think uh, the desire, the, com the compulsion to be done with life is not necessarily, I do not think that's a pathological thing. I think there's a freedom in that. I, I just think it's also, I think it's also a, um, a question that um, you know, I, I'm not sure how to open up in the mass and in, in the general public. I don't know how to have this conversation outside of our circle right here. No, it's hard. Nancy Gallagher just wrote, my dear brother who suffered terribly and was an organic farmer in Bolinas took his own life in Mendocino three years ago. I completely honor his decision as hard as it was. We were very clear and open about our love for one another. I forgive myself for not knowing how to help him and also him for needing to move. Mm -hmm. So I think, was your sister suffering a lot when she made that decision? Yes, but had all her life, you know, it was, yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. she meant to do it. It was not a cry for help. She was very serious about it and she wanted off. Here's Steve Heilig. My experience with suicidal patients strongly suggests that granting them the right to die if they request it actually extends life more often than not. People feel empowered and reassured and don't actually take that action. If otherwise well cared for. It's ironic, I guess, but true. This is part of the reason we work to legalize it in California. As many leading MDs within the California Medical Association agreed that it was true. The right to die can be seen as in fact pro-life. And Steve is a colleague of ours and has thought deeply about these things and works with the San Francisco Medical Society as well as with Commonweal. And it's, amen. And it's also, and as all these things go, so com complex. And it's also true um, that in my experience, a lot of times when, when I am faced with patients who come to me seeking to hasten their death, it's also true that most of the time that request is them checking to see what I feel about it, checking to see my feelings. It sometimes is a plea to, for better pain treatment. It sometimes is a plea for depression and anxiety to be taken seriously. And so it's also, I guess if we just need to say here and find our sort of proportionality with this issue, most of the time in my experience and colleagues in palliative care, when people present the, the desire to hasten their death, very often it ends up by time you open that up and tend to the suffering underneath that request, very often that request goes away. So, um, so there's a, there's something important here. It's very important for me as a clinician to not take that request on face and say, Oh, just met you. Oh, you want to get off the planet? Okay, let's go. You know, I'll help you. There's, it, it is, a, it's an invitation to look more deeply, to talk more deeply, to interrelate more deeply. And at the end of that process, we find that that request, that desire to get off the planet is, is, is a durable one. And is then, then that's that, then, okay. But there is a process by which I am duty bound and legally and ethically to check what's behind that request. Um, and I just have to, I need to say that process because I need to mention that because most often that process doesn't end in them dying. That process ends in uh, us doing something different in the treatment plan and the, re and the desire to die goes away. Right. So also true. And uh, there's a wonderful quote here from Marie Eaton. Uh, we need to remember that people of color have historically had care withheld or offered in substandard ways. So there is a deep mistrust of withholding or stopping care when that choice is given to them by the system. So true. Yes. Thanks for that, Marie. Uh, profoundly important. Uh, but let's bring in here uh, something we haven't mentioned. Uh, when people are feeling uh, a, a wish to get off the planet, which is, uh, which is psychedelics. Mm -hmm. And uh, so how do you, and I know, see, I am far less constrained than you are. You are a physician, you are, you know, well-known palliative care doctor. I'm a 
freelance mm -hmm. human being who gets to say what he thinks, you know? Mm -hmm. So, uh, but uh, how do you, uh, let's assume most people who know they want to try psychedelics will try psychedelics. And I strongly suspect that it will help many of them uh, choose not to get off the planet mm -hmm. quite as soon. I think that's true. Yeah. But, and of course, there's the legalization of psychedelics, which is going on, which I think will have both positive and negative consequences. Mm -hmm. But do you uh, ever consider counseling somebody who is expressing end of life concerns that that might be uh, something to consider? I certainly do. I mean, it's what an interesting time here. Then this this subject and the use of psychedelics, the therapeutic use of psychedelics, has been around a long time. But now uh, it's we're revisiting this idea, and there's a little bit of this subject that's underground and a little bit above ground now. Um, and I thoroughly. I mean, I can't wait till. <laughs> I don't know if you can hear the muffin man, but she's hey, we love the muffin man. All all the ambient sounds are just fine. Is the muffin man going to come visit? Well, yeah. Oh, there's the muffin man. All right. <laughs> Speaking of finally a webinar. The cat has showed up. <laughs> um, I get really, in, you know, in, traditionally when someone comes to me despairing for meaning in their home. I check them for depression. I check from this for this and that. And at the end, it, it may be that they're in a perfectly, perfectly rational, sane, healthy place, which is they do not feel part of this world. That's not just depression talking all the time, etc. And in the past, all I've had to do, all I've, all I've had been able to do would be to a, maybe I can help you get off the planet. Maybe I can just dampen, put, put a wet blanket over you with Valium or something like that. And maybe I can just keep talking to you and either distract you or maybe you'll find a way to a different way of looking at the world. Those have been my options. But with psychedelics, with one session, you know, the idea that you can have, a, 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 you know, work with someone through an, an experience, mm -hmm. it's not just a transaction of take a pill, it's an, an experience that, un, that is fascinating in and of itself. That and one one encounter like that can make you feel part of the world again, make you f see things that are beyond yourself. All sorts of existential angst can drop away. That you not only you still love life just as much as you ever did, but you feel part of it. I mean, that is that is a direct um, fix, and it's 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 amazingly accessible. So I get very very excited about this potential for psychedelics, and it's not just a potential; it's here. Um, so yes, I do point people in that direction, and would like and to do more of that. Given the wide range of psychedelics and the the very wide range of effects that they have, and so on and so forth, is there a kind of ladder of psychedelics that you talk to people about in terms of what they might consider, or do you leave that to others? I generally, I, I can speak from my own sort of personal experience. I don't have enough professional experience to be very clear and point people to very specific mm -hmm. agents. These days, most of the data are around, are around psilocybin, and so that's where I generally point people. Mm -hmm. But it's also true that I'll ask them their own experience with these substances, and a lot of people have their own experiences and to draw from. And I just get to bless them and suggest a sort of set and setting and integration work and things like that. Mm -hmm. Um, do you find that after these psychedelic sessions and when you do follow up, that there's a change in perception of pain as well? There's a change. Yes. Insofar. And I don't know if it's a direct effect on pain. It's just more like, it's like, it reminds me of with folks who do a lot of existential work. It's like their fear of dying, for example, doesn't go away. They just have a different relationship with that fear. I think similarly with pain, there may be an analgesic effect that I don't quite appreciate, but it's, it's less that the pain goes away. It's just that the person's relationship to that pain shifts. And they can uh, see beyond when people ask you about uh, the use of uh, uh, cannabis substances for pain control. I'm, I'm truly interested in this. What do you say to them? Oh, well, gosh, it's pretty easy to recommend cannabis these days. Mm -hmm. In part, though, because the relative to other special analgesics, you know, 
it, the side effect profile is pretty darn de minimis. So it's easy for us to say there's enough, there are enough data to suggest that uh, cannabis can be very helpful for pain and other symptoms, nausea, insomnia, anxiety, depression, et cetera. Um, but even if it's a relatively un, poorly understood mechanism or anecdotal kind of data, we do know that it's pretty hard to hurt yourself acutely with cannabis too. So it makes it pretty easy to recommend people give it a try. Um, and again, it's all relative. If you're comparing cannabis to uh, hydrocodone or other opiates, the side effect, it's pretty easy to recommend trying cannabis first. So, and it's not just me. I mean, that when I was practicing at UCSF at the Cancer Center, a pretty conventional place, um, everyone was recommending cannabis pretty broadly. It's, it's very different now than it was even three or four years ago. And I see psychedelics following in that same vein. Could you talk a little bit about the differences in your experiences with people facing end of life questions at different points in the life uh, uh, spectrum? You know, what's it like for you when you're dealing with uh, a young adult uh, as opposed to an older person? Mm -hmm. Well, it's so darn individual. Um, I'm, I'm tempted to sort of, I'm tempted to say that older folks, because they've had this sense of, of, you know, they've had 80 years on the planet, whatever else, you name, you know, that there's, that there's a narrative there that dying is less tragic if you're older. Uh, and if you're younger, therefore, it's harder because they haven't had a full life. But if I'm really honest, I mean, I, that doesn't, it's not really how it plays out. I've worked with just as many older folks who are freaked out to die and don't want to, as I have younger folks who are ready to die and okay with it. So I think that narrative that I was starting with is really my projection that we kind of hold this idea of if you've been around a certain number of years, well, then you've gotten to this or that and you're ready to go and, and light and death doesn't seem tragic versus tragic if you're younger. Again, I think that's just, a, these are narratives that we live with. You want to see some folks who really deal well with their impending death? Go to a pediatric hospice. I mean, kids, the, the resiliency the, is astounding. There's such a plastic sense of the ego. It's, it's, not, it's not so, they haven't had so many years to construct these ideas of themselves and to acquire so many things to lose. So. It's complicated. I think um, that said, some of the cases that I've that have been most difficult for me are uh, young adults with children, you know, and um, parents dying before their children are uh, get to see them uh, get to, to to get to grow up. That's really extra hard. But there again, I feel like that's most even that's a projection. I've seen young young parents turn their own death into an incredible lesson. One more thing they're going to teach their kid, and it's a, it's so. I guess I'm as I talk myself through your question. I just uh, I guess I, I think it's better to resist the idea that younger deaths are harder than older deaths. I think it's just enough proof that it's all over the place and much more an individual comment. Steve Heilig just wrote about our psychedelics conversation. We presented a conference last year at UCSF. Uh, UCSF sponsored our medical society, San Francisco Medical Society, and more mainstream groups and sold out with over 300 attendees. Mm -hmm. Presentations were very positive with research moving forward on many substances. None of this would have been allowed just a few years back. A sea change is underway. And you know, there seems to me that that psychedelic sea change again speaks to this floating hope that we referenced at the start mm -hmm. that perhaps perhaps we can use this as a turning point right because psychedelic consciousness we know has some deep relationship to the human spirit mm -hmm. uh, and and as you were saying young children haven't formed egos yet and then you go through a middle period of life where you do a lot of ego formation then at the end of life hopefully you deconstruct your way or in later life you deconstruct some of that necessary ego structure mm -hmm. um and so um so 
it seems to me, both of us were saying early on that we hold this sense of hope, but that we're going to go through a lot of suffering. Yeah. And it seems to me that the psychedelic work points in the same way. And so do the huge number of people who are, quote, either spiritual but not religious or religious and spiritual. Mm -hmm. So that there is, there is this undeniable movement of human consciousness taking place, I guess is what I want to say. Yeah. And now we're given the shock treatment, which brings us all into this period of time. Mm -hmm. So the question is, to come back to the palliative care uh, analogy with which you've made such a profound contribution, mm -hmm. how can we ease the suffering but also help with the emergence of the soul qualities that may lead us both individually and collectively in the best possible way? We take a stab at that. I think the answer to both of those is much the same. The, the overlap is, I think, the answer isn't to somehow get really disciplined and really effective at crowding out hard feelings, hard emotions, hard thoughts, so that we can stay somehow in some pure space of a contentment. Rather, I think that what we're being summoned, and the answer both to this expanding how to how to work with this and, and, and facilitate this expanding consciousness and come to terms with the sort of individual suffering in the meantime, the answer to both of those things is to build out your capacity to sit with hard feelings and therefore not just hard feelings, sit with everything. And therefore your eyes are going to be pried open to see beyond that very loud pain or that very noisy um, letdown or whatever it is that can crowd out other points of view, other feelings. So I think the answer here is what we're being asked to do is expand our capacity to feel things that we can't change and therefore to see beyond any one source of stimulation. Um, I, I have gotten more mileage for myself and with patients out of expanding their ability to sit with pain than I have been able to extinguish their pain. Mm. BJ, this has been an extraordinary conversation. Neither of us knew where we were going to take it, but we trusted that it would work. Uh, before I do a close, is there anything you'd like to add, anything we haven't covered that you'd like to reflect on? Well, I think it's just, I was just going to say, I mean, just in keeping with what we we're just describing, sorrow, sadness is not the enemy, you know? There's a lot of warmth and sadness. There's, and so well, I think that's, I think my takeaway here is like, let's see if we can enter in relationship with what, hard feelings that we may have tried to crowd out. Crowding them out now is impossible and there's some grace in that. Hmm. And before I say goodbye to you and say goodbye to all our friends, um, Kira Epstein just posted some of our upcoming uh, learning community events. Catherine Fulton, a really extraordinary woman, uh, is going to be on uh, on June 28th. Carl Safina, who's an astonishing naturalist, uh, whose work Becoming Wild is his new book. He's just amazing. Rachel Naomi Remen is coming back. Uh, he's Carl Safina, July 3rd. Rachel Naomi Remen is on July 17th, and we're going to talk about being old. <laughs> so uh, that'll be a lot of fun. Last time we read poetry to each other. Tom Yeomans is coming on July 24th, and he has a beautiful book called uh, Holy Fire, The Process of Soul Awakening. Uh, he and Rachel are old friends. Um, and um, I guess the last thing I'd like to say is, um, if you like this kind of work, Kira just posted this, um, we really appreciate your support. We run on a homeopathic budget, and uh, so uh, your contributions really help keep us on the air. So with that, B.J. Miller, I am so grateful for your friendship, your partnership, our many years of work together, and uh, I hope to see you back in the learning community before too long. It's such a blessing to be with you. No, thank you very much, Michael. I love you very much, and thanks, everybody.